Welcome, Warriors. Yay! We are beyond excited for you all to hear this episode. We had a fantastic guest. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd say beyond excited, like giddy. Yeah, giddy. I know. Yeah. Loved this conversation. Absolutely loved it. Warriors, yes. we know you're going to love it. We spoke with Jesse Bartell. And before Abby hops into her recap, let me let you all know a little bit about who Jesse is. Jesse Bartell is a store manager of Bookhampton in East Hampton, New York. In his free time, he likes to take photos of streetlights at night and write about nerdy things. He has an MFA from Sarah Lawrence and spends much of his time indoors. That's Jesse. So Abby, let's hear about this chat. Yeah. So like I say all the time, one, Jesse is super, super awesome. And it was such a fun time connecting with him. It was the first time me and you really like connected with him. I think Mm -hmm. just the other times were through email and stuff. Um, And again, it's just like really special when like you meet someone for the first time and it's comfortable, especially when there's a whole bunch of anxiety warriors and anxiety negotiators in the same space. Right. And we're just for the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So Jesse starts off with, you know, sharing how as a teenager, he started having panic attacks um, and it just felt super, super like normal. This is what people deal with. Right. When they're teens. And it wasn't until he was older that he one realized like, oh, these experiences are panic attacks. And two, this isn't something that everyone experiences and maybe I need some extra support. Um, He shares about his challenges around like, like processing visual information. And he gives this really incredible analogy and um, just really how the way he shares how his brain works is just something that I can't articulate because my brain is not working. Um. <laughs> it's true. It's complicated or it, not complicated, but like, it's just very layered. It's really hard to recap what he was shared about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it kind of threaded throughout. And although I could really vibe with what he was saying about his brain and, and the way my brain processes too, I felt very much in that um, he articulates it way better. Um, he He shares how, you know, before he you know, found therapy and different tools, how he used to self-medicate as a way to quiet his brain and to actually feel peace. Um, But he later realized he wanted to have a long life. And so he found different ways to support himself and help himself. And now he's almost three years sober. Jesse is really just great at, at communicating his experience and painting it in a way where I think everyone that listens can really feel like they're part of the journey and see themselves in his story. Um, And I would highly recommend that you listen all the way to the end because one, you are going to learn some fun facts about Nick Cage. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn some movies that you might not have seen and, and why it's worth watching them starring or with Nick Cage in them. And you're also going to get some book recommendations too and find out all the different ways on why it's super cool to be running a bookstore. And so, you know, this was just, it, Margo and I are fangirling out throughout, like, you bit. know, like, bit. oh my God, like, <clears throat> oh my God, wait, you walk in a bookstore? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> Abby was stunned, y'all, that, that like, there's a good amount of walking around and lifting <laughs> heavy book boxes. She was like, wait, and he, uh, he, he, I think he used the term, he, he, he will use the term, like people romanticize the idea of working in a bookstore. And uh, we certainly did. We really yes. romanticize it in our heads. But and... I think I romanticize it even more now. Oh, I can get exercise. Yeah, and it's even more awesome. Meet authors, like, come on. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely stick around to the end of the uh, interview too, because we hear about celebs mm-hmm. and some authors Jesse has had communications with and has met. So cool. Maybe you have to be an extra book nerd to really appreciate it. But we know that if you're listening to us, that you're a book nerd, at least on some level, at least on some level. You've at least picked up a book. Yeah, that's it. That's your only requirement is that you maybe read one book. (laughs) Maybe corduroy. I'm trying to think of like childhood books that maybe you've read. All right, warriors. We can't wait for you to hear this conversation. So without further ado, here's the show. Welcome, Warriors. Yay! We are so excited to be back with you all today. We have an amazing guest, Jesse Bartel. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Yay! Thanks for being here. 
Yes, we were just Lord. chatting before we hit, you know, record about like our random DM conversation and you were so cool and really upfront about like, yeah, cool. Sounds good about coming on a show about anxiety because <laughs> it was kind of random. And one of my anxieties is like, well, one of the things I'm working on in my own anxiety journey is stepping up and like saying the thing and asking for what I want. And it was great to connect with you. And I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, no worries. I'm, yeah, I'm not, I know I seem very scary uh, and, you know, intense, but <laughs> contrary to popular belief, I'm very approachable. <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting because I didn't, I don't, I didn't get the scary vibe. So that's new information. Okay. <laughs> just maybe, maybe, maybe that's not something about me then. I don't know. What yeah. <laughs> I was terrified for you. <laughs> he was going to block you, report you as spam, you know? Yeah. <laughs> This weird fraud account is trying to get me to come on their podcast. Yeah. Uh-huh. Some MLM <laughs> yes. ladies. Just wait. We're going to start selling you all these anxiety yeah. healing things. And yeah. We got <laughs> you just tapped into one of our pet peeves, actually. I just got a, like a creepy crawly vibe crawl over me because, oof. Anyway. Okay. So we like to hop right in here on the show. So um, share with us how anxiety has kind of shown up in your life. Yeah. So, so anxiety really showed up for me when I was, um, like a teenager, uh, pretty, pretty intensely, I uh, started having panic attacks when I was a teen. And I think it had to do a lot with sort of like feeling like I didn't have control in my childhood and, and stuff like that. And that's kind of how it manifested. Um, but, uh, outside of that, like the way I process visual information can cause me to have a lot of anxiety. So, uh, I feel like uh, I've made this point before, and this is what therapy has helped me realize, is that uh, most people, when they approach their day, their life, whatever it is, they're kind of sitting back on the couch looking at a giant, huge, big screen TV, and they're just kind of looking at everything sort of like uh, piece by piece very, very easily. But for myself, uh, the way I approach things is, is like through like a viewfinder or like a microscope. So um, the having that constant sort of attention to detail can be really great, but it can also be very difficult to kind of go through a lot of normal things that other people might not necessarily think would be very difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, it makes me super into details and very, uh, very attentive to things. But uh, most of my life is revolves around people pulling me away from that viewfinder, that microscope, because you have to talk to people, you have to do your job, you have to go to the, you know, store whatever it is you have to do and so you're pulled away from that thinking and it can cause quite a bit of anxiety and you just kind of learn to deal with it um and other things like social situations are difficult for me as are imagining social situations um on top of being a visual thinker so uh, i imagine a lot of how things should go or shouldn't go before they even happen um and that can cause a lot of problems for myself uh and eventually what led to me to be very like uh, dependent on substances and uh, to, to kind of shut that part of my brain off because it can be a lot. Um, but you just, uh, you know, that was the easy way out, I guess. <laughs> and so you, you have to learn how to create tools uh, to get yourself out of that. But sometimes when you're young, you aren't given those tools and no one tells you how to do it. Um, and of being a 34 year old millennial, you know, we're sort of just past that point or I wasn't old enough within like the timeline to like therapy or like getting help as a kid was really like part of the narrative it wasn't something that you were like oh let's go you know maybe we should get this checked out talk about it with someone who's a professional it was more like you're just kind of fucking weird um and I think I think that's where a lot of it landed so it's just you know late bloomer to mental health unfortunately and fortunately so mm. I mean we're both millennials and we totally we told, I feel like I can speak for both of us. Like we feel <laughs> right. Like late bloomers. Like, I mean, that's why we have this podcast, right? It's like, let's just normalize this shit now so that people uh -huh. can get help younger or identify it in their kids younger or whatever, whatever comes up. Um, first of all, I love the way you speak, the way you speak, like with the analogies and like the way you said, like, you know, social situations, but also imagining the social situation, like all of that, I was like, oh my God, like, yes, this is my life too. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. I yeah. feel all of it. Um, and so I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to one, remember them. And then two, um, <laughs> limit it to like one or two. But my, my first thing is like, 
as a teenager having panic attacks, like, you know, that first panic attack, we've, we've all had them. Like you feel like you're dying. Uh So like at what, what did you think was happening when that was happening as a teenager? And at what age did you learn that it was actually a panic attack? Yeah. So it's super interesting. I mean, like a lot of things when I was growing up, um, I just thought that that meant that I was like really scared or uh, just overwhelmed with emotions and just thought that it's what every happened to everybody. Like you don't understand a lot of the times when you have that, that like when you're a kid, that that's not normal. You think that because you're experiencing it, then everybody else must experience it. Like it must be a normal function within all people that we all get to these moments where we feel like we're dying and we like, you know, you know, our brain are basically, we feel like a static television throughout our whole body and we can't feel anything. And like, I just thought that that was what we all went through. You know, like I I didn't understand that what I was experiencing was actually a, a, like a red flag for my mental health. And so it wasn't until probably my like, mid 20s that I really started to understand like what a panic attack actually was and I think sort of like the idea of like sometimes I feel like anxiety and things like panic attacks become a part of like the sort of like colloquial speak of like uh just as a way to say like I was really overwhelmed or scared and not actually like what an actual panic attack is and So for me, like I started to really kind of in my mid 20s, dissect my mental health a little bit um, and then gave up. But at that point, I was starting to look into it and realizing that, oh, this is not uh, how people go about their day to day lives. What what I am doing is 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 just very different. So, yeah. 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 Wow. I mean, I it's so funny because we whenever we talk to a guest, where I'm always blown away by how different their story is from mine, but there are always some things that I feel like so many of us people who have anxiety, who are anxiety warriors, whether they be former anxiety warriors, present to, you know, and somewhere on the spectrum, it just feels like, oh yeah, but I had that exact experience, right? Um, uh-huh. And something you said too about, you you just said it, it was like, you started to dissect it and reflect on it in your 20s, which I just want to hammer home too, like is still pretty young. Like you're still, you know, through most of your twenties in like your adolescent brain and to be able to find the, either the will, whether it be on your own or from your community or whatever that led you to start self-reflecting or start thinking about those things. It's like, I just want to acknowledge that that's an amazing thing. Like, I feel like a lot of people aren't necessarily in the mindset yet to, start paying attention to yourself in that way in your like early Mm -hmm. to mid twenties. Um, and I would just, I I would love to hear more about, like you said that, you know, you had learned to grab some tools, right. From Mm -hmm. that, that things that weren't say substance abuse or alcohol or whatever. So I want to hear more. Can you share more with our listeners about, um, some of the things that you, I guess, in your self-reflection journey, how did you reach the point where you were like, I need some tools? Like, was there like a light switch or was it a slow thing? You know? Well, I think, I mean, if we're talking about where I'm at now, it definitely was like a slow thing. Um, I think that uh, what it was is I was so overwhelmed with the way my brain operates and how, like I said, I process information that I didn't know that there was a way to, compartmentalize those thoughts and look at them a different way and then walk around them as, as opposed to like trying to run through them all the time. And, um, I'm trying, I mean, for like something like my sobriety, which I've been sober almost three years now, like that was something that was like a light switch that like eventually snapped in me. That was like, I thought I was going to die. So it was just like, okay, well maybe we should do something different and try it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, previously it had, it had been around sort of like, um, you know, what other people were telling me, like, this is not normal, like, this is not, these are not normal things that people do, like, and, and, um, your or thoughts, normal thoughts that people have or, or normal ways people approach situations. Um, you know, you shouldn't be having panic attacks. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it was getting some help there initially. Uh, but then, like I said, I kind of gave up. I, I, it was really, it was difficult. Um, and, 
I had some personal things happen to me that really derailed me. Uh, and I really was, uh, as like with anything, when you're stuck in a particular way of thinking and you're miserable, you'd rather be stuck in a particular way and miserable because it's what you know, it's what you're used yeah. to. So I, there, there was no sense in me, like I didn't feel like I could just keep doing the way, what I was doing to myself for, you know, however long, because I just, the other, the other side of it just seemed like a lot of work and very exhausting. Um, and it just, it took a while for me to get to that point where I realized that, uh, I actually wanted to see, you know, past the age of 40. And I think, you know, I think that was for me, the, the, the snap. It, mm -hmm. it, yeah. I just got several rounds of full body chills. Yeah. Share all of that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah. I, I really, I really love how you highlight. Cause it's so, it's so true. Even like, I know people that like are constantly complaining about their life. Right. And they're constantly overwhelmed and they hate their job and they, uh -huh. but, but they don't want to make a change because as uncomfortable as they are, it's what they know, or as uh -huh. uncomfortable as they are, it's like still comfortable enough for them to not give them that push. And because uh -huh. right. What's on the other side, like, who would I be if I'm not constantly overwhelmed and anxious or right? Yeah, exactly. It was that I mean, that's that's sort of it, too. And like when you sort of like when your friend groups and when you're um, when you're just used to like getting fucked up all the time, like that was just like what you knew. And that's how you had fun. Uh you're going to just stop that? Like, and, and then, and then what, what's your identity? Like, I, I, like my identity is that I'm going to not do all those things for the rest of my life until I'm dead, <laughs> which is hilarious when you kind of look at it. Cause it's like, no, I had my whole identity this whole time. I'm still, right. I'm more of the person I should be or, or uh, who I am, mm. but it was being stuck in that sort of like, uh, you know, I explained it as like the snake eating its own tail, like the Ouroboros design of like, just constantly be stuck in that cycle and never breaking out of it. Um, and then uh, once you do, you're just like, oh shit, like I'm, I'm like, I'm like a, a way better off. Like I'm way more sure of myself, you know, of course, like I'm very, still very insecure about things and I get grumpy all the time about certain things and whatever, but I'm just a person. But compared to like how my thoughts were about who I was like, even just five years ago is completely different, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and, and I love what you just said, because you're, you're so, I, I feel it so much like in any change, you leave a job, you get out of a relationship, you move somewhere, you, you like, there's this piece of like, I'll speak for me, me, where it's like, oh my God, I'm losing part of my, who am I without this job? Who am I without this person? But I love what you just said, which was like, you're, you're still that identity. You're more the identity, right? When you're shedding away, yeah. like unhealthy behaviors or whatever it is when you're shedding that like you're getting closer to who you actually are right uh -huh. so you don't even have to like grieve the loss of the identity because it's actually like there's that core identity in you and that's I really I love I love the way you you explain that thank yeah. you thank you <laughs> um all right so tell us about or tell us more about some of the ways that anxiety kind of shows up in you physically, like how does it manifest in your body, in your mind, in your behaviors? You know, you can kind of speak to it uh, in where you are in your journey right now, or maybe how you've evolved in that way. I, you know, you sure. talked about panic attacks in high school. I'm mm -hmm. guessing that those are few and far between these days, if, if they are happening at all. So like how, how is anxiety kind of manifested in you physically? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, for, for a long time, it manifested in, uh, you know, self-medication. That was really the best way to deal with it. Uh, and, you know, to what it is to have a really loud brain. So um, things like drugs and alcohol were a good way for me to just completely just shut that shit down. Like it doesn't, like if I did that, like I could just, I could feel peace, you know, and I could, you know, I could fall asleep and I didn't have to, you know, worry. And if I was during the day, if I was anxious or upset about something, I knew that as soon as I got home, that I could turn that all off again. Um, and so there was this kind of looking forward to in this continued cycle of um, numbing those thoughts and those things, but that but we're not doing that anymore. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, the way it manifests now is, uh, I mean, I definitely, uh, I pace a lot. <laughs> I pace around a lot. Uh, which is why my job is so, I, you know, I run a bookstore and that's a really great way for me to get out a lot of pent up uh, anxiety because it just requires me to move all the time. 
Uh, I go for walks a lot. I do a lot of walking. Um, that is very helpful. Uh, uh, you know, the, the usual stuff, tapping legs, biting lips, these, these types of compulsive behaviors, uh, uh, are, are ways that, uh, that do it. And then also like, if I'm having anxiety, like I develop negative thought patterns that just continue to be negative and, um, they just, you know, if I'm not able to like, it, it used to be like, I would spend a whole day in a, in, a, in a cycle, but now it's like 10 minutes and then I'm able to like jump out of that. Um, and that's, you know, really, really helpful, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I guess it shows up in a lot of ways. It can also show up with me being irritable. Uh, you can show up with me, um, you know, uh, basically like not like being so tunnel vision, like I'm not even hearing the outside world. Um, yeah, it, it shows up. It shows up in, in those ways. Once again, back to the whole like microscope yeah. on the viewpoint of how I see things situation. Yes. Well, I appreciate the fun fact that when you run a bookstore, there's a lot of movement. It's not something I would have thought of. So. <laughs> yeah, no, running a bookstore <laughs> is very, very intense. I mean, people think, you know, like romantically, like, oh, you can just sit around and read all day. But, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's, that's not the, it is. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. It's a, it's a lot of running around and up and down stairs and lifting 40 pound boxes. And, uh, it's, it's a very physically, it can be a very physically intense job. And it's, especially the bookstore I run because it is, uh, is a pretty busy bookstore. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, definitely helps with, with me being able to just kind of walk around the store <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, that's, it's good for me for that. So. No, I, I, I love that. Like, I, I'm like partially joking about like, oh, I didn't know you, but like, honestly, yeah. <laughs> what a great like job to match the energy, right? Like, yes. I, I just feel that too, with the anxiety and the overthinking, like, like if I'm too much in my brain and I'm sitting, it's much easier to spiral than if I'm too much in my brain, but all of a sudden I'm walking and moving and stuff. It kind of like helps me get m more clarity in my, in my thoughts and in my brain. And so, um, yeah. I mean, you're just selling this to me more about wanting to like try to find a bookstore yeah. to work at because the <laughs> movement piece, that's awesome. Right. Like, yeah. Um, I love to go. Oh, sorry. I'll go ahead. Oh yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to make the connection to similar to what you were just touching on Abby, which it's like, you were talking about how pacing was one of the ways that anxiety kind of manifested in you. And then you also quickly transitioned to also, I walk a lot and that's helpful. Right. Uh -huh. And so I just love that so many of the things that our bodies and our minds and our behaviors do are sometimes what also can be supportive to our anxiety, right? It's like, okay, maybe the pacing is a little bit intense. So then it's like about how do I make this walk a little bit more mindful, right? And maybe uh -huh. not every time you're pacing around the store, you're not in the middle of overthinking, what do I need to do? What check inventory, check on that employee, like whatever. But there are going to be times when you're like, okay, I'm just walking from A to Z you know, I do have a little bit of anxious energy. So how can I make this walk a little bit, you know, more intentional? And so I just love that. Some It just was a reminder to me that like, well, yeah, sometimes the things that show up in our bodies and our behaviors aren't necessarily bad things. How can we wield those, um, you know, perceived negative effects that our body's having and make it into something positive and useful? And so like, mm -hmm. I'm like you, I like walking around. That helps me. The idea of pacing on the other hand, right? It's like, okay, I'm thinking of like somebody running around a room, like not really in their body. Um, mm -hmm. And both things have merit, I suppose, but I just wanted to make that, I just wanted to, you know, echo that connection of just like, oh yeah, sometimes like I teach yoga to kids. I need to make sure I'm feeling good before I go hold space for other people. That's mm -hmm. why I practice yoga before I go teach yoga, right? But mm -hmm. at the same time, if let's say I didn't have a chance to practice, maybe I can just do one thing to calm myself down before I have to work. Right. And so it's just, it's just so interesting to me, like hearing from another person that does something totally different. Um, like, Hey, we can take those things that our body's doing and, you know, use it for something useful as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I just want to say like, based on both of these conversations, um, it hits back to something else that you said. And, 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 and what you said was, you know, you would self-medicate to quiet your brain to feel peace. Right. Uh -huh. But, but the thing that I want to hit on is just like how restless it can feel to be experiencing anxiety. Like anxiety is so many different things, right? It's like the racing thoughts. It's like the shaky body, but like, ultimately, um, it is not peace. It is chaos. Right. Uh -huh. 
And, and I just really, I, I just, I really appreciated how you said like to quiet the brain, because that's like why we seek to do the things we do. And some things might be helpful, like mindfulness and, and yoga and, and walking. And some things might not be helpful, like self-medicating. Right. But, but right. it's that seeking for that peace for that, like, oh my God, brain, please shut up. Like, give me a break. Right. And, uh -huh. and so I just really wanted to just just revisit that just for a second, because I just like, just, just quieting the brain gives peace. It really does. And I just felt that when you said that part, I like wrote it down and everything. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. So talk to us more about some of the coping tools that you have. What, what's in like your tool chest as far as go-to strategies for dealing with <laughs> yeah. the anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. So my self self soothing techniques, which we call them. Uh, so I go on. So I go on a lot of walks for sure. Like I, I, I uh, even when I'm at work. Luckily, I'm very, uh, you know, the position I'm in. I'm very privileged to be able to kind of, you know, just walk out of the store if I need to. <laughs> uh, that's not that is not something everyone can do. Uh, you know, who's just where, wherever they work. But a lot of times when I'm in the store, what I'll do is I'll just leave the store, walk around the block. Uh, and come back to the store if I need to like write an email or I need to, I've been, you know, I got upset at something. I'll just go walk and I come back. I'm able to look at it differently, you know, and uh, that's super helpful. I do that at night as well. I love going for walks at night. Um, that's also uh, another big privilege sign, you know, and it's not something that everyone can do and uh, especially uh, not for women to do by themselves at night. Um, so that's also something that uh, I have the privilege of doing, but I like to take pictures at night. That's one of my favorite things to do. Um, the other thing is uh, when I go into like um, food stores, uh, like stop and shop and I'm shopping, I have to put earbuds in and listen to music because I get sensory overload. So uh, if I were to go in there without that, uh, it's, I could do it, it's fine, but it's it tends to be like, I, I start getting irritable because, uh, I'm looking at all the things, I'm hearing all the voices, uh, I'm trying to listen to what's on the radio, um, listening to this one hour conversation that's going on, um, and I'm just trying to get it. But anyways, but if I listen to music, I'm able to process the information in a more organized way. I you know, can go through my route that I have and get the things that I need. Um, so yeah, I do that in st uh, visually stimulating areas too, so city areas, things like that. Um, uh, uh, writing, I have a, I write a lot, um, and not not necessarily writing about my uh, emotions or my feelings, like or it's not like a journal thing, or I just I, I write uh, about stuff that I care about and interests that I have, um, and that is just a really good way for me to collect thoughts that I've been having and just kind of sit myself down and be able to for like ninety minutes, you know, pump out fifteen hundred to two thousand words and edit it later. Um, Video games are also a good way for me to uh, deal with anything like that. I really love video games. I grew up on video games. And uh, while I don't necessarily play them as much anymore or probably have the same sort of uh, excitement about them, I do still play video games. It is very helpful for me to uh, have hand-eye coordination on a screen and kind of lose myself in, in something else. Uh, and definitely when I come out of that like fugue state, uh, I can be like, you know, sort of, a little more adjusted or relaxed. Um, I also like to build models. So uh, I like to build uh, Lego sets, but also uh, like Gundams, which are these like uh, plastic uh, models that you put together. And they take a lot of time and a lot of concentration. Uh, and um, there's something that I really love doing um, because they do sort of narrow in my focus. Uh, and I really love the result of it. You know, I could put, you know, hours and hours and hours into a Gundam model and at the end of it have something I think is really cool looking and that is very rewarding um and I, I love doing that uh the uh the last thing is uh mindfulness techniques which are you can you know habit zen whatever whoever, whoever you want to look at uh, but really like uh what I big takeaway for me for mindfulness is is uh is uh placement so like so like say if I'm feeling like a rush of thoughts about something if the window's open, I'll feel the breeze and I'm like, boom, breeze, we're here. We're right now we're here in the room with the breeze. Uh, if you hear a song somewhere playing, you're like, that song, I know that song, I'm here, here. So like that kind of mindfulness of remaining present uh, sometimes is very helpful, but it requires me to like have like an exterior thing happening for me to like be in touch with. And uh, so 
So it's uh, that's always a good way for me to kind of regain my balance when my thoughts start to get a little wobbly. Yes. I mean, <sighs> so many good ones. Like I love, I love, <laughs> I love all, I hate, and Margo does too. And I won't speak for Margo for the rest of it, but we both hate grocery shopping. And, and mm-hmm. part of it is that sensory piece. It's just too much going on. It's so overwhelming. Like the moment I get in there, I'm like, please get out. Like, I don't care. Like I'll throw some food in a basket and get out of it. Like it's too. (laughs) So like, I love that you acknowledge that because it is like a stressful place to be, you know, but Mm -hmm. the way to like focus. Um, I love the video games. I play video games too, right? They definitely help with like anchoring in and like also having fun. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I just, I really love the mindfulness piece because, you know, like I, Margo and I love mindfulness. Like we are huge proponents of it and I see value in seated practices, but I, I personally see more value in the, in the moment practices, which is what you're talking about. It's like, Mm -hmm. how can you take this idea of mindfulness and apply it moment to moment to moment? It's not just something where you go sit in a cave for two weeks or, you know, you Mm -hmm. sit on your cushion for an hour every day it's like no yeah yeah vipassana (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's like a silent uh meditation it's a silent mindfulness meditation for uh, about 10 to 12 days um it's horrible but it's also like life transforming (laughs) but it's horrible yeah i'm sure (laughs) Um, we talked about abby's two experiences with with vipassana on on the show so i thought i'd throw that in yeah fun (laughs) just yeah i mean amazing but awful Um, But that's the thing is like anchoring ourselves into the present and it can be anything as simple as a breeze, right? Or Uh a song we hear. And I really love that because that is something like we can all take with us. Like, oh yeah, I'm spiraling. I can Uh feel the bottoms of my feet. Oh yeah, I'm spiraling. I can, I can feel the sunshine if I'm outsider, you know, like, so thank you. Those are, I mean, so many good ones there. And I I definitely relate to a a bunch of them. Uh Yeah, Yeah, I I, think- no, go ahead, Margaret. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I love the spectrum, right? It's just, I love that we went from things like writing 1500 words to doing yeah. something that's, that's maybe it's, it's active in your brain, but less active, maybe physically like playing a video game. Right. And then there's building models. And I mean, it's just, it always just makes my heart sore when I hear that, that people that have anxiety, people that are struggling with anything are actively seeking out joy, right? Cause at the end of the day, I feel like the one thing that all of us need to like keep going, keep living, keep showing up for work, keep doing the things is those little things that light us up, right? They could be really mundane or small and, um, but life is hard. And so we need to cope with it too. And so like, I just like the spectrum of stuff. It's like, Uh here's the, in the moment practices, like tapping into your five senses, right? Noticing a breeze, listening to a song, focusing on that, Uh right? From the external, And then also, you know, drowning yourself, like in something pleasurable, like building a model, right? Like I just, I like the spectrum of the range of things that each of us can Uh find to be like, yes, I not, not only am I coping and surviving, but I'm also thriving. This is enjoyable. It lights me up. Right. And I just feel like we all need that balance, a little bit of everything, a little bit of in the moment and a little bit of like, what's just going to make me happy. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, uh, you know, and, and once again, like, uh, you know, the, the, these things can only get you so far and you really have to, you know, like, I, I think it's 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 super important to remind everybody like how important therapy is. But I, I also feel like, you know, with that said, not everybody can afford therapy and not everybody is given that privilege of having um to be able to see someone uh, and, you know, and really kind of develop tools with this other person who can hear them out. So it's, 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 it's sort of hard for me to always be like, you know, go, you know, get to therapy because that will really help you because you just don't know where people are coming from and, and what their expenses are and, and this and that. Um, but it is super helpful. And if you get to a point where you're financially able to acquire it, you should, you should invest in that because with that, along with these other, like, these are all things that I learned you know, by just being very intimate with my emotional health. <laughs> and so, so, you know, you get, you get to these, you get to these points, uh, you know, before that. And like, 
like these are things that I had already done, but once you start, you know, I, I, I had gone to therapy, then left therapy and I'm, I've been back in therapy now for, uh, what's this month? I guess for yeah. like 10 months now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was good for me to kind of, you know, go back to that. And it's also part of like a more rational recovery or I'm in more of a rational recovery. And, uh, that means that, you know, I apply, you know, practical things to my sobriety and my day-to-day, -day, um, management of my mental health. Uh, and, uh, you know, AA is super helpful and, you know, believing in a higher power and all that super helpful. Um, but you do have to kind of keep yourself grounded with things that you can, um, do sort of, uh, in the here and now and, uh, you know, that aren't, um, you know, your faith is your faith and that's, that can be helpful, but you can, you should also be like really rational in how you approach, um, your mental health and how find ways in which, uh, can, um, be, like I said, practical, rational, um, easy to do. Yeah. So you mean like if someone tries to sell me the cure for anxiety, I shouldn't buy it. If someone says, <laughs> yeah. If someone sells you the cure for anxiety. <laughs> Shark tank, baby. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I don't the, the, I personally don't believe anyone has the cure. I think we all find ways to like support ourselves and our mental health and our, you know, and, and I've been working with my anxiety for a long time and and I totally agree with therapy. And I've been to a therapist. That's how I learned about mindfulness. I had someone that introduced me to that. Um but it's so funny because Margo and I sometimes get these emails about like, oh, we have this guest for you and they've cured anxiety and we would love to have uh -huh. them on your program. And we're like, no, no, nope. no, nope. yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's just... <laughs> like, yeah, there, there, <laughs> there, there's there's no cure for like if your brain's the way it is, your brain's the way it is. You can definitely make it better in some ways. But uh, it's about managing what you've been given, you know, and understanding how your brain operates is far more important. You know, it's just like I will never not be an alcoholic. Just it's like I beat alcoholism. You know, if I if I start using it again, I'll I'll be using it again like that will you know, that will be my life. And so, you know, it's it's not like a, a, a quest in a video game where you do it, you complete it and you're done and you don't have to think about it ever again. Like, no, it's that's it's with me at all times and we have to be aware of it. You know, it's 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 like anything else. You know, it's like I'm aware that I, you know, have poor eyesight. So I have to wear glasses when I drive, you know, like this is, you know, it's not it's you don't have to look at it like you're uh, like there's you're less than or there's something wrong with you, which you can and sometimes I do feel that way about myself but at the uh, but you just realize that you just think differently than how other most and other people think and mm -hmm. uh your, you know your your mental health is contingent on you know what you didn't know about your mental health and that's really you know what it came to be for me was like I just didn't know anything about anything and that's why I was treating myself so poorly so right oh like I know <laughs> Right, I mean, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, yeah, that was just, yeah, I, I love the way you speak about just understanding your own mind, right? Mm -hmm. Just, and the more we beat ourselves up, right? That's, that's not going to help anything or anyone. It's not going to help you certainly. And then that's going to trickle out to your loved ones or community and, and, and so on. So um, we had a former guest who had mentioned right, that she used to work with certain populations of neurodiverse um, populations. And she would always say that like, they all had their own unique genius, right? Everyone's brain was operating the way their brain was operating. And it was just like, how do I have the world meet your level of genius? Uh -huh. And what, a little bit of what you just said reminded me of that because it's just like, I think it's really easy for all of us to sort of slide into like, oh, well, you know, this is just how I am. And, and to some extent that's true. Right. But then, like you said, there are things we can do to manage, right. To cope with, to understand how we are and why, why we are the way we are. And there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing wrong with us. Right. And it's not necessarily that we need um, to bend to expectations or the world or whatever. It's like, sometimes, no, I can hold firm with my boundaries. I can, you know, sort of make the world meet me where I'm at. And I just love that. Um, I don't know. I just, I love that everything you shared about, about the mind. I appreciated it. Okay. 
let's talk about your relationship to anxiety these days. How would you describe it in like a word or a phrase or just if, if you were just like, hey, what's going on with your anxiety these days? Like, what would you say? Uh, you know, I try, you know, I try to um, frame it as an opportunity uh, more than anything. You know, I, I really try to and that sounds so uh, woo woo of me. And, but I, I really I really do mean it like I, I really feel like you know the way that my brain works is an opportunity for me to learn more about myself and also use it towards the things that I care about so um and it's a way for me to see myself outside of myself in sort of like a not disassociative moment way but like in a way to like really uh get out of my head and understand you know the way in which um, my thoughts progress uh, on a day to day level. Love that. <laughs> I mean, it really it is. It's 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 a way that we can learn more about ourselves or more about like um. I, one of our guests said, uh, you know, they use it as a teacher, right? And and you said like mm -hmm. an opportunity, and I and I love that because that reframe is really powerful. We're not like victims to our anxiety. Sometimes it feels awful. But also uh -huh. there's opportunities to learn something from it, learn something about ourselves, learn maybe something that's going on in our mind. We're not aware of that's been in the back of our mind. Right. And so yeah. when we can catch it, we can then all of a sudden examine it. Uh -huh. Yeah. I love that. So good. So good. If you could step back in time and speak to a younger version of yourself, what kind of advice would you offer a young Jesse? Uh <laughs> uh so i was like i was i was thinking about this one a lot because there's just so many funny things came up but i uh i would say just first and foremost <laughs> get into therapy and get on medication immediately <laughs> um i don't i don't think uh medications for everyone and i'm not a proponent of saying that it's uh something that everyone needs in order to adjust themselves but it really works for me and it it, it definitely works when i'm uh, sober, uh, because my, my body, my brain can actually interact with the medication. Um, so I think, you know, if I like really just like, just go full in on your mental health, Jesse, like you're going to have a lot of things are going to happen to you, a lot of trauma and things that you can't control and you're not going to know how to deal with it. And so like, this is like, that's, I think would be like, if I could catch myself at like 12 years old, I would just be like, you, you gotta, gotta go do the thing, you know, just go do the thing. And, uh, you know, this will save you a lot of time later and uh, it will save you uh, a lot of relationships you didn't want to get in. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, it will it will definitely help, you know, um, you become the person you, you want to be and hopefully kind of speed that process up a little bit. <laughs> oh, God. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That's great advice. I feel like every 12 year old needs to hear that advice exactly right it'll help you get to who you want to be much quicker if you yeah. support at a younger age uh -huh. yeah. so good so final question before we get into some lightning rounds what does being an anxiety warrior mean to you when you hear this phrase what comes up uh, it's funny because I thought about this one a lot too and I I think I prefer to call myself an anxiety negotiator <laughs> <laughs> all right Explain. i don't i don't yeah i don't know if uh if i can i don't think i have the just who i am to go to full war with something like that i think for me it's really about being cunning and understanding and uh i think negotiating and using the good parts of the anxiety for like i said the things i care about and uh making it proactive uh versus um knowing which parts don't work and which parts are harmful uh, and pushing those, like I said, walking around those thoughts as opposed to trying to run through them. Um, for me, that's, that's how I see myself. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I was like trying to literally uh, identify as like a warrior and it just, it wasn't helping. So I was like, okay, I'm a negotiator, you know, <laughs> I'm more of a big brain guy than a big brawn guy. So uh yeah that's 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 my compromise to yes that yes i, I mean, love it speechless 
If we have a spinoff, it's going to be the Anxiety Negotiator podcast. Yeah, CSI so good. Anxiety <laughs> Negotiator. <laughs> That's right. You'll we'll be like live in Stabler. I don't know who. I mean, yeah. we'll be like the yes, and then you could just be like you know organized crime, but it'll be Negotiator instead. Yeah, exactly. We just gotta get Dick, Dick Wolf's team on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm obsessed. I love that so much. Like, and the, just the phrase cunning and understanding, it's just like, fuck yes. I love yeah. that. I mean, to me, you know, it's so funny because we've only had, um, I don't know, we've had like just maybe over 50 guests at this point. I mean, I'm not sure, but only a couple of y'all have ever said like, no, the word warrior, I won't define it. It doesn't work for me. And it always makes me so much, just smile so big because it's just, it's just more proof to the power of like making everything your own, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Like, and not being defined by a question, by the name of a podcast, by a situation, like that is, that's really freaking powerful and an, an important message, right? Like we, we don't have to define anything. And like, when we name the podcast, when we think about ourselves, we like the phrase warrior because that works uh-huh. for us, Right. Right. I, I just, it makes my heart sing randomly when it happens when people are like, mm, nope, that's not me because <laughs> that's freaking cool. Like, why should yeah. it be? If it's not you, it's not you. And I just, I'm obsessed with this phrase. Like if, yeah, like Abby said, if we could have another pot, if we could spin it off and be like, okay, this guy, Jesse Bartel, he's hosting the anxiety negotiator, <laughs> you know, and like, I'm just plant seed planted. You know, I really love it. So good. <laughs> I love it. And and to be fair, Margo, when you're reflecting back, I mean, it sure does sound like that was an anxiety warrior response, right? 100%. Showing up as yourself and, and saying what's true for you is all anxiety warrior there. So. True. Can you tell that we're control enthusiasts, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that was great, but now it's yes. time for our favorite part of the show, which is lightning round. Lightning. That's how you know it's time for lightning round. That's the official sting. Yes. So this is just like a handful of um, questions, fun, get to know you type questions. Anxiety can be heavy, weighty. And so we like to end on a high note. We like to end with a light, a light little interview. And um, Abby and I are just going to go back and forth, each of us, and ask you a couple of questions. Are you ready? Let's go. All right. Okay. I got I got one. Okay. I actually got three. I started writing them down during the, okay, during well, the interview. Okay, I'm just going to start with one. I'm only going to start with one. All right. Okay. What was one of your favorite video games as a kid and one of your favorite video games now? So, yeah. So, I mean, I think as a, as a kid, I, I don't know what age are we looking at when we say kid? You, you get to choose. Okay. Like, all right. Yeah. So, so like when I was like, uh, eight or so, like I loved the Sonic games for my yes. Sega Genesis. I yes. just thought they were just the best. Yes. Uh, they were, they got hard. Um, but I, I just, I really loved Sonic as a character. I, I read like the Sonic there was novels about Sonic and I read those. Uh, Pokemon also was a very like important game for me when I was about 10. Uh, the first Pokemon I played that uh, on repeat with my friend, we'd be up in his room for, for 12 hours on playing on our Game Boys. Uh, when I was when I was in high school, you know, I think uh, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic and the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind were two of my favorite games. There's just these really big uh, you know, choices affect the outcome of the game type game. And and I put, I think I put like over 200 hours in Morrowind. I love that game so much. Um, right now, uh, I still play a lot of old games, but right now Starfield is definitely a video game I like very much, which was developed by the same people who did Morrowind back when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 years wow. old, whatever it was. So yeah, so like, you know, Starfield for me is a really great game. I, I really enjoy it. Um, and uh yeah, so I've I've been playing a lot of that lately. Love it, love it. All right, it's like speaking German. I heard Sonic. I'm like, oh, I kind of know that. And then it was like yeah. Star Wars. I'm like, okay, I know Star Wars. Like, my, <laughs> video games give me so much anxiety. My husband plays a lot of video games. His favorite game is Fallout. I'm guessing you know. 
Yeah, that's that's yeah. actually developed by the same people who made Starfield and the Marvel Ooh. game. Bethesda, Bethesda, Bethesda. Bethesda. I knew, I know yeah. Bethesda. I just know that one word is yeah. fun to say. See, that's my yeah. relationship to video games, words that are fun to say. Yep. Um, my, my experience with video games is playing Contra in like elementary school. <laughs> yeah, that's hard as fuck, that game. You had to shoot, you had to shoot everything. You, you, you had to shoot all the things. Very violent. It was very violent. <laughs> Developed by Konami. Uh, I remember playing that on my sister's Super Nintendo. And, uh, man, that game was mean. But, like, it was fun because it was so violent, you know? <laughs> I blame my brother. He was the one that introduced me. To, um, anyway, that was it for me. That was my one and only video. Okay, I think Adam had me play Stop, Stopped and started. I started and stopped at Contra. For... <laughs> that was it. And I was, like, eight. I was eight years old. I was like, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm out. Man, that's, that is the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Adam had me play Fallout last year and I was like, you should have filmed me. I was just screaming at the TV. <laughs> I was just <laughs> howling because it was so stressful. Anyway, okay. So I have to know about this is a this is to the T with the email that you sent. I, I just want to know about the Nick Cage. Oh, that was worth my question. <laughs> <laughs> Did I ask yeah. you, first? you had the gavel <laughs> first, Abby. You missed out. Okay. So I, I mean, many what the F. Yeah, so many moons ago, I was in grad school at Sarah Lawrence, and I had to do a project outside of my other main writing project, but I had to do another, um, like, thesis dissertation, and we could choose to do it on anything we wanted, and I was like, well, I really love Nick Cage, and I own almost all of his movies on DVD, so... Let's do that. So what I ended up doing for that particular one, and it's up on, this is online, by the way, you can find it. If you type in Jesse Bartel, Nick Cage, I think it will come up. It's online. Uh, you can read all of it, but it was about uh, the movies leading up to his film, Leaving Las Vegas. I don't know if you know that movie. Yes. So like Leaving Las Vegas won him an, won, won him an, uh, uh, an Oscar, right? So that, that, was, that was his Academy Award or he won that for that for that role and then after that he just did like the rock he did face off like he just went in a completely different direction but i basically studied all the films he did up until that point and like what his acting style was and like what how it led him to do this like movie he wasn't even i don't think he ended up making all the money he was supposed to make for that movie he just wanted to do it because he really liked the script and they made it for like no money and it just ended up being like a real work of passion and he really put himself in it. I mean he, the, the movie's like so depressing and I, I don't know if you guys know it but it's about Nick Cage and he goes to Las Vegas to just drink himself to death oh. um yeah and so basically over the course of the film he like falls in love with this prostitute and he just gets more like sicker and sicker and just eventually dies at the end of the movie um and it's just just a rough movie to watch but it's it's brilliant and it's and and he's brilliant in it and i i do genuinely like him uh, uh love him actually and i think i think he's really interesting uh it's someone who uh gets a lot of shit but i i feel like uh he's always been very genuine to himself and what he's wanted to do and uh still is to this day i like you go and interview him now about movies he'll talk to you like he's just a kid who likes movies and i Aww. think that's uh you know that's really I, I don't know. I think that's that's really endearing. He's a very endearing person to me. Interesting guy. He is an interesting. <laughs> yeah, guy. interesting guy for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I feel like I've only watched a handful of his movies. So, all right, question number two: If you were to recommend three Nick Cage movies to <laughs> sure. someone that has really only seen Con Air, oh, um... <laughs> okay, yeah. I hate that movie so much. Oh, I'm triggered. I'm triggered. I'm gonna take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> that movie that was so fun put the put the bunny back in the box I, that movie makes oh i'm gonna i might have to log off i don't know i can't, hear, I can't talk about con air y'all so what would be three three movies you would recommend to someone who's like oh, i've never seen in a cage movie before uh, uh yeah sure so you know i definitely would recommend stuff that's probably not as popular but i think are really good movies that if you like just if you just like good movies like if, if you want something that's entertaining go watch national treasure like that movie's so great everyone's seen it i could watch that movie like eight million times but but like for me like there's a movie he did called red rock west which is uh an earlier film and it's about him um going to this small town and kind of getting caught up in this like crime situation uh, but it's peak, it's peak young, early cage. The, ah. the beginning of the movie is him getting out of a car. He's got cowboy boots on. He's smoking a cigarette. His hair is all long. 
it's just it's killer and um what's his face is in it uh who died oh man what's his name uh oh my goodness i can't think of the actress's River name Phoenix. but he plays No, 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 no. No, it, it, <laughs> no, 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 no. Name all the dead actors, like in <laughs> oh, the world. Man. I, yeah, no, yeah. I was thinking anyways. like old school. <laughs> yeah, he was an older. He was an older actor at the time, and he he died. Uh, whatever. Anyways, but it's a great movie. I'd also would recommend um, bringing out the dead, which is a movie. It was it's a Scorsese film that nobody watches. Uh, oh. And it's about uh, an ambulance driver, and it's him and John Goodman are ambulance or an ambulance driver in the city in New York City. And uh, it's sort of like about this PTSD thing that, you know, that this 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 main character, Nick Cage, is going through and he like sees things and uh, Patricia Arquette's in it as well. And uh, oh. they were I think they were they they actually might have been divorced at that point. I com I forget. Oh. But they are they remained good friends. Um, and uh, so so she's in that, too. And I love Patricia Arquette. I think I think she's just she's just the best. Uh, and yeah. Um, I guess a third one. Oh, I just had it. Oh, I guess uh, it, maybe every a lot of people have seen this, but Raising Arizona. That's a Coen Brothers film. Uh, it's wacky. It's, uh, you know, the study for that movie, Nick Cage was really into Looney Tunes. So it has like this like Looney Tunes-esque feel yeah, to it. it. Uh, it's funny as shit. Like it, it's just a, such a, and if you like it, it, so there's like two ends of the Coen Brothers spectrum, right? You have like the really serious, like, uh, you know, intense Oscar movies. Um, and then you have like the weird, like goofy, like Burn After Reading and Raising Arizona uh, uh, Alley. And uh, I love everything they do on both ends of the spectrum, but uh, it's definitely more of the goofy, weird yeah. uh, spectrum. And, and he's just so physically interesting in that movie because he's just very like, he, he's just, he's just all, he like, he's like a rubber band in that movie. And it's just it's just a fun movie to watch. The script's great. The the jokes yeah. are good. Uh, it still holds up. I think I, I watched it a few years ago. Uh, I still think it holds up. So yeah, those are those are three Cage movies I would recommend. I've never nice. seen them, and I've written them down. So that I'm gonna yeah. watch them. The what you just sold them to me based on explaining them too. Like right. you know, I I I I'm I'm into it, and I'm excited. You got it. No problem. And okay, what what uh, a fourth one for for a bonus fourth one if you're yeah, okay. really into like horror movies and violence and really weird shit, I recommend Mandy. It came out about I want to say 8 years ago now. Mandy is we is weird but so cool. It is such a cool movie. Think of it as uh, a drive with Ryan Gosling but like bizarro version of that. <laughs> this is the best yeah. way I can describe that movie. <laughs> bizarro drive. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are some good recs, people. Write them down. Okay. Um, I'm just going to throw a bunch of like this or that's at you, like just a handful. You have to answer fast, though. Okay, you're really lightning these. Okay, here we go. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> Crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Uh, could smooth, yeah, sure. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Teleportation or flying? Uh, teleportation. Chocolate or candy? Candy. Video games or books? Ooh, fuck. Uh, yeah. Probably books. Yeah. All right. You see, you did pretty good. Yeah. That was a tough <laughs> one at the end. Jeez. Yeah, that, that was that was definitely like, yeah, which of your loved ones do we kill to save the other? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's good. Um. Okay. Final question for me. I feel like I need to have it be book flavored. So... I don't know which way I want to go with this book question, but I, I guess, I guess what is a recent book that you read that like moved you in some way and why? Uh, sure. I, I'm going to, I'm going to say, uh, there's actually two books within the last year. Mm -hmm. I really felt that. And one was a book called cutting for stone. Uh, by Abraham Verghese, which is about ah. these twin, these tw these twins who, or is it Verghese? I don't know. But anyways, he, it's about these twins who uh, are born and they both become surgeons and they work out of this small hospital in Africa. And one of them eventually goes to um, Boston and New York to to continue uh, his work. But it's just a very good emotional novel, and uh, it just it was it's really wonderful, um, and. 
The other one was a book by Simon Van Bowie called The Presence of Absence. And it's this very short, uh, like 200 page novel that you could read in one sitting with how it's written. And it's about a dying writer. Um, but I, I uh, and, and sort of like deathbed books or dying writer books are overdone. But th th it just it's really because no one does anything interesting with them. Um but this this one uh, in particular was was really great and uh, it was just very emotionally affecting for me uh, and it's because it's really just about love and how love can kind of migrate uh, and transform into something else you know over time and um, I think I think wow. that was really what affected me the most out of that book. Mm, that sounds really good. Yeah, I wrote uh -huh. those I both down too. I think the first one that you said is on my TBR list, so I'm I'm yeah, glad. it's, it's really. <laughs> Yeah, it's a substantial novel. Like it's, you know, it's a, it's good. Yeah, it's like know, 700 pages. pages. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, but it, it's, uh, it's worth it. You know, the writing is so beautiful and the story is just, is just really good. Yeah. So nice. All right. I'm going to keep in the same vein, but I'm going to let you like choose your adventure. So I'm going to give you two questions and you choose the one you want to answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Choice number one is, uh -huh. I imagine in your field, maybe you've met a handful, if not more authors in real life or over Zoom or in, you know, even via just email or whatever. Um, and so you could either tell us an author that you met and, you know, how it like, like what your experience was with that person, um, uh -huh. hopefully positive, or you can share an author that you'd love to meet someday and why. Mm. Sure. So I actually... <laughs> I would love to meet Stephen King, just hand like I would just love to meet him. And there's a very strong possibility that that could eventually happen for me. But um, the person who I actually ended up having a Zoom call with was uh, a guy called David Mitchell. And David Mitchell wrote a book called Cloud Atlas, which is really, really big. Oh, yeah. Then the, 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 the Wachowskis made it into a kind of a... Uh, a very like uh, mixed bag of a movie. Some parts are incredibly well done. Other parts are just like, what are you guys, what are you, what are y'all doing? Um, but uh, I, I was able to speak to David Mitchell through a Zoom call because of uh, just connections with the with the publisher. And it was at the time when his last book, Utopia Avenue came out. And it just, I have the whole conversation recorded because I set up my phone to record the conversation of me talking to him. And I'm just like this giddy little schoolboy, just kind of like laughing and like all smiles. And it's just like, like I waved to him at the beginning like this. Like, <laughs> And like, I, like, I just think he's absolutely brilliant. He's one of my favorite contemporary novelists. Uh, he wrote this book called The Bone Clocks, which people uh, still like to argue with me about. But I, I just I loved it so much. Uh, Cloud Alice is great, too. But I think his other books are just even better. Um, and uh, that was he was just so articulate and kind and uh, like unaware, very humble, unaware of how good of a writer he he, he really is. And uh, it was it was really great there. I do. I have in my life uh, met a lot of people of say high profile and definitely met a lot of authors and um you know don't meet your heroes kind of thing it can can sometimes be a situation where you definitely like you know I've learned to like really love whatever is the thing they put in front of me and I don't really want to talk to them because they're just going to ruin it for me <laughs> um Fair. but uh, to, the chance to meet and talk to David Mitchell was was really wonderful and it turned out that he was just a very kind intelligent uh, and respect, respectful person. And I just, uh, I'm just very honored to have had that conversation with him. So, yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Well, yeah. And yeah. We, we are going to be hopeful for you that you get to meet Stephen King. Yes. Yeah. And again, yeah. selling, running a bookstore, right? Like, uh -huh. like it didn't even cross my mind. Like all the author, like, I don't know why I didn't, I definitely just thought you just sat around and read all the good books all day, you know, and that was it. <laughs> but, yeah, but, 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 but also like being out in East Hampton, like I, I, so many celebrities and people who you, so you know, you see, on, you see on your phone or TV on the top all the time, they could just walk in and they're just a client mm. and you, you know, you know, uh, I won't, you know, I won't say who's bad and who's, who's, you know, who's whatever, but like you who do meet people and you <laughs> yeah <laughs> just kidding I, well, won't, I, won't I, I, will, I, I will say uh just I've met a lot of great celebrities but Robert Downey Jr. is a sweetheart and he spilled oh, I nice. remember he uh 
he came in and it was like it was like February or something like that. And he like spilled his iced coffee on the floor. And like I came out of the office and I was like, damn it, Bobby, what did you do? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was just really funny. And then like we were both like he got the paper towels and we were both like cleaning it up. And oh like he God. was just very he was just very hilarious and about the whole thing. And uh, like, also like, not like clean this up, bitch. Like he was just, like, very <laughs> like, like he was very like helpful and he was just, he's very sweet. And I'm, I've seen him several times with, at, at, at the store and every time he's just like, he wants to talk about books, you know, and like, he's just a nice guy. And that's, that's that. always nice to see, you know? Yes. Uh, that's awesome. That's yes. awesome. So I'm, awesome. I'm a I think, Robert Downey Jr. fan. I know my mom is. So, mom, I know yeah. you're loving this. Fran, Fran yeah. you're listening. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, you know, Jesse, when I, I first found you, because um, somebody that Abby and I are both in community with as kids yoga teachers is Susan Verde. And she had made a post <laughs> at one point that she was in your shop. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm like, books. I know she lives out there, you know. And I was just like, and that was when I started you know, from my yoga account. That's when I started following you initially. Um, and so, yeah, that's how, that's how I had found you initially. And author. Yeah, Susan, Susan, Don't Susan's supposed to have you. About Susan. She's the most. No, I love, I love, I, I love Susan. She's supposed to have me over for dinner, like, soon. Uh, Because I said, Aww. you gotta have, you have to make me dinner just because. Uh, But we have a really great, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just because. Uh, but we have a really great relationship. Susan's a, a firm supporter uh, of the store. She, she Aww. gives me. She sends a lot of schools my way, so I do bulk orders for schools for her books. Wow. And um, like I'm friends with her mom, like <laughs> like Aww. like uh, it's it's you know it's like her the whole you know it's like oh she Susan's just sort of like part of my life out at the bookstore because she's very much part of the community in in my life there, and she's uh, it's always funny to realize like oh yeah she is also a very you know sort of <laughs> like she's a famous children's book author, <laughs> right? She's not just Susan from the bookstore. Yeah, by, <laughs> yeah, by, yeah. By the way, yeah. <laughs> Right. um so so yeah it's yeah she's she's a she's a great she's a good person great friend uh mm -hmm. and yeah she's she owes me dinner soon yeah oh <laughs> all right called out susan um, <laughs> most, most generous person like when i when i wrote my book and i um i saw published it back in 2020 and i like dm'd her you know we we had known each other through the kids over world but I DM'd her, I was like, hey, any chance I could like pick your brain about like author visits and stuff like that? And she was just like, oh, let's just jump on a Zoom. And I was like, really? <laughs> like, and she was just, I mean, we spent like over, you know, 40 minutes just like, you know, completely free. And she was just so generous with her time and her energy and information. And it was just like, uh -huh. that was one of those moments for me. It was like, meet your heroes. It's good. I, I've tried Yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's fine though. She's she's never doing anything, so you just you just you can you can bug her whenever you want. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's, she's really needs to start doing something with her life. That woman, it's I know she'll make it someday. <laughs> someday. <Yeah. laughs> oh my gosh, she's the best. Love you, Susan. Okay, yeah. um, thank you so much, first of all, for jumping down in the mud with us for lightning round and lightening things up a little bit. Not that our interview was, you know dark or anything so but like, so depressing yeah. oh, it's just sometimes anxiety you know even when the conversation's fun it's like you're still talking about anxiety the whole time so um but we appreciate your time and your energy oh thank um, you sharing with us before we have you share with our listeners how they can connect with you um we'd like to ask all of our guests if they have a win of the week to share something big or small that felt like a win it does not have to be from this week it could just be from, you know, recent times, but do you have a win? Yeah. So I was, I got in contact with an author who I very much adore. This is back to, you know, meeting your heroes. And uh, she writes, her name's Karen Travis. So she wrote a huge amount of Star Wars books. She wrote um, a bunch of books for the Halo video game franchise and for the Gears of War franchise. She also had her own uh, series um, published by Penguin Random House, Simon and Schuster. She's a a big deal. She lives over in the UK. I sent her an email, being like, "Hey, like, I'm I'm planning on doing like a real big Gears of War novel thing this upcoming fall, and I was just wondering if we could, you know, if you could just talk with me about that." And I just sent the email, thinking like, "Oh, like, you know," because she said, "Like, I don't really answer all my emails. Like, it's not really she's, you know, she she's just not it doesn't seem like she's interested. She's like, I won't, you know." Anyways. So uh, a few days later, I got a response back and she's like, yeah, she's like, let's, uh, you know, let's set something up, talk. And she, uh, we've been going back and forth now with emails about Gears of War as a franchise. And she's kind of 
illuminated a lot of stuff about the 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 lore that she contributed to that uh, i had no idea i just thought it was part of what the big brain of you know the the game studio had made up but really she contributed a lot of this stuff and it's like she's she's so sweet that there there's two of her two of her books that are out of print because simon and schuster dropped the ball and i was like i was like i don't know if i'll be able to cover those um but what was that it was balloons but i was like i don't know if i can cover those but um uh because i can't get a hold of any and she's like i'll just send you some and she like sent from the uk wow. you know two books to me uh wow. to 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 good to read and it's just like very gracious very very uh very intelligent and she really you know she loves uh you know she she's got i don't know how old she is exactly but she's older than me but she 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 loves the worlds that she helped build and oh. uh and that to me is like really endearing too because like she really cares yeah. Uh, and she really cares about the readers. She's like, I really, she's like, you know, she's like, I really wish we could get these, these books in the people's hands uh, oh. that, you know, the, the two, the two that I couldn't get uh, the three are easily published by Del Rey uh, with Penguin Random House. But uh, anyways, but that was, that was for me, was a really big win because she's yes. someone whose stuff I've read for years. Uh, and uh, I really respect her as a, as a genre writer. Uh, and it turns out that she is uh, uh, very British and very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> That's I feel awesome. like that's a huge win. That's like a at least double, if not triple. Like she responded to your email. She, you yeah. know, chatted with you. She sent you books. Like there's like yeah. wins upon wins there. <laughs> yeah, I, like I, I told my therapist. Yeah, I told my therapist about this yesterday, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, it's so fucking cool. Yes! you <laughs> talk to me. <laughs> um, like I'm just like so excited. Like I, I remember I screen grabbed. Like the when I got the response back from her on my email and sent it to uh, a friend of mine uh someone who i dated but who were still good friends and i was like this is like she's and i was like i was like i have to tell this to somebody because you're the only person that's gonna get it <laughs> and she said she was she like replied she's like oh my god it's so big nice so like, she knew like, how important it was yeah exactly it was like it was like good to have that reaction from someone who's like who get it because like if i said it to anybody else <laughs> but, ah, that's good for you man like, like cool oh, yeah that's <laughs> like i'm happy you're Still sober, buddy. Like, good job. Uh, I'm happy you know, and you're happy. Yeah, we know you need your things and we're happy you have your things to keep you away from uh, getting high. But uh, yeah, no. So it was, it was, it was, a. it's it just, that was for me, was a huge win. I felt so uh, grateful for that. So yes. yeah. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> Amazing. That sounds so cool. All right. So share with our listeners how they can connect with you. Uh, sure. Uh, probably the best way is Instagram. You could type in Jesse Bartel to find me or my handle is damage per second. D-A-M-A, <laughs> D-A-M-A-G-E dot per P-E-R dot second S-C, <laughs> S-E-C-O-N-D. I know how to spell. I write. Um, I write. And I, yeah. And I, I run a sub stack. I, I write uh, weekly about things, uh, nerdy things. I like video game uh, novel adaptations and Star Wars novels, particularly, and I kind of write about stuff that's sort of adjacent to that as well. Um, but I do a weekly newsletter for that. Um, but I think Instagram is probably the best way to find me. I'm not really on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> push yeah, push the novel uh, by Sapphire. Uh, but it's uh, it's um, <laughs> uh, I used to be, uh, but it's just it's such a it's just such an awful experience over there these days. Um, or awful feeling, not an experience. It's more or less the same experience, but like, it's just, it's just Fair. such a icky feeling when I'm on there. Um, yep. But yeah, I guess Instagram is the best way to find me. Yes, there, I'll settle for that. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much again for sharing your story and your energy with us today. And um, I know all the warriors are going to love hearing from you. Yes. You got it. Thank you. Or the negotiators. The negotiators. Or the negotiators. Yes, the negotiators are going to really appreciate <laughs> hearing from you. Yeah. The warriors and the negotiators. Yeah. They're going to be like, he gets it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I now feel seen in this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's our time. <laughs> We're tapping into a new market, maybe. Again. Yeah. Dick, Wolf, Dick Wolf's people. All right. Well, thank you so much. One more time. And thank uh, you. We appreciate you. Appreciate you. Bye. Woo, Warriors, obsessed with this episode. Yes. That was mm-hmm. so fun. So fun. Yeah. And we had never met Jesse before. Like, mm. I always love this when you just meet someone and it's just so easy. You're like, mm-hmm. 
all all peas in the same pod with different just vibe different peas in the same pod or same yeah. peas in different pods you know like you just vibe <laughs> you're right you just we vibe. just vibe yeah yeah well i guess the pod is just like having anxiety but we're all different inside right yeah right yeah so different peas in the same pod for sure um how to feel like I've got like a million takeaways swimming around in my brain right now. It's mm-hmm. hard to focus. I'm still just like feeling like warm and jittery from the excitement of the yeah. episode. Right. Um, I just, okay. So my first takeaway, I mean, I literally don't know what I'm going to say right now. My first takeaway is that I love the phrase anxiety is an opportunity. Mm-hmm. That moment really stuck out to me in this conversation. I just, You know, we've had some of our uh, previous guests talk about like using, like you mentioned, using anxiety as a teacher. I talk about my anxiety being like a friend or frenemy, something that exists on the same plane as me, Mm -hmm. but it isn't me, right? It's an experience that I'm having. It's a response that I'm having. It's a reaction. It's, you know, and I just love it. I, I just like this new reframe of it's also an opportunity. It's a avenue for creativity, right? Like we've heard people on our show talk about, um, it being like, oh God, what was it that, um, a motivator, Christina mm-hmm. Iavelli, I called it a mm-hmm. motivator, right? Um, and so I just, I love this also, right? Yes, and yeah. it's also an opportunity. And I just, um, and the way Jesse described it, just like learning more about himself, learning, which then helps him learn more about and have more compassion for the people in his life, right? His, mm-hmm. the things that he cares about, his, you know, community. And um, so, yeah. I just, that's my number one takeaway. Just yeah. Anxiety can be an opportunity to learn more about yourself, learn more about your mind, your thoughts, you know? Right. Right. And then like, what do you need? Right. Like yeah. I totally agree. And I, I did love that reframe too. Like it's, it's a very helpful reframe to think about it. Right. Like kind of like going back to Ryan um, Benson when he was like, mm-hmm. you know, I get to do, it's like, oh, I get to view anxiety as an opportunity. Right. Yeah. Um, my takeaway is like totally different. Um, and it's more, I don't know if it's, I don't know what label I was going to put on it, but I, throughout the entire conversation, one of the takeaways for me was just um, the importance of language and communication and analogies, because mm-hmm. um, I really love the way Jesse told his story, like just totally like from the beginning where he talked about you know, the viewfinder and the microscope, yes. you know, and, and to be able to see a whole big picture, um, like the, the way he spoke throughout even stuff like managing, what do you say? Like managing what you've been given, right. Um, or, or quieting the brain, like just all of these things, like they weren't all analogies, but the way he spoke really resonated where I felt like I could see myself in his story. And it really just made me think like the value of, of an even like negotiator, right? Like we, when he said that, it's like, oh, we can see what that means for you, right? How right. he negotiates with anxiety, right? And, and so for me, my takeaway is just like, when we can clearly like articulate our experiences or, or think about it in an analogy to share with people, like more people can probably see themselves in our stories when we, when we share it in certain ways. And, and so I just really valued the language, the way he spoke um, and, and the way he communicated his story, because I just, you know, I just, you can tell he's a writer, (laughs) right? Like you can tell he writes, even if it's not about him, you can tell he writes because he's able to paint pictures for the audience to feel like they're a part of. Totally. I completely agree. Yeah. I just, I, like you said, I feel like I could see and feel and resonate and relate. Right. And if that goes to authenticity and vulnerability, Mm -hmm. right. Which he certainly showed in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and there, there just seemed to be just a, an awesome level of honesty to the way that he shared his story too. Right. It wasn't just like, Oh yeah, I have anxiety. You know, it did not that we've, I feel like most of our guests luckily have been really open and, you know, willing to share and raw. Right. But there's, there's always, I don't know. There's something about certain people's authenticity that just feels disarming and also makes me want to lean in, right. Mm -hmm. Want to hear more 
And Jesse did speak like that. Like everything he said, I felt like I was hanging on his every word about it. And like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree. Um, How am I supposed to have one more takeaway when there's like a million more? Okay. So I think I, I, I just want to reflect that I loved the range uh, and the spectrum of supportive coping tools Mm. and strategies Mm -hmm. that Jesse kind of shared with us. And it was just like, I feel like at even one point, it looked, you know, he had mentioned that like he jotted down some of his thoughts, like when he got some of our questions ahead of time. And I felt like this level of excitement in him, which I meant to mention while he was on, but like um, when he was talking about his strategies, which made me excited to hear that, mm-hmm. right? It was like, these are things that not only are supportive, but they're also filled with joy. Some of them, some of them light you up. Right. And so I love that spectrum. And it reminded me a lot of my own coping tools. And I imagine a lot of our listeners coping tools, which is just like, sometimes we need those in the moment things. Like I need to just feel this breeze right now. So I can anchor, I need earbuds in so I can get the grocery shopping done that I need to get done. Right. And we can just sort of objectively see that and be like, yes, those are survival, like not survival mode, but like, those are the things that I need in order to function Mm -hmm. right at my most optimal self. And then there are the things like building models and writing creatively, right. And video games, excuse me, that are just, are more like ways to just enjoy your life that also help you cope with anxiety. Right. 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 So I just love that. And, and being intentional, like, like seeing it through the lens of this is another thing that like, it brings me joy or it helps me, you know, with, with coping or it helps me, you know, like, it's like, I think sometimes with anxiety, it's like a push uphill as opposed to like permission to just enjoy the ride down. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't know what that, I don't know where that came from, but that's what I was like thinking about is like, it's just it's okay to enjoy yourself. Like it doesn't always have to be heavy mental health. It's like, no, I like doing this thing and I'm going to do it. Yep. And I don't have to overthink it or explain it or this or that, you know, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, It doesn't have to be about mental health. I just like this thing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it brightens my world up. So yeah, exactly. 